Spotlight on Fields. This is our third in our series of Spotlight Forums where we try to bring residents and town leaders together to discuss matters that affect all of us. We take a topic that is on the minds of many in town to try and start a dialogue. Um, our previous spotlights included the drought and Hopkinton's water systems and traffic and pedestrian safety. Let me begin by introducing myself for those that don't know me. My name is Christy Willitson. I've served on the EHA board for the past seven years. Our other board members are here, including our president, Nanda Barker Hook, there she is, um, Amanda Fargiano, Cindy Bernardo, Tara Sanda, Mary Puella, and Amy Ritterbush. Uh, for those that don't know, EHOP was founded in 2007. It's a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization run by Board of Active Citizen Volunteers. So, what is it that we do and why do we do it? Well, right now, as you all know, we live in an age of information overload. Constant flow of news and commentary in our daily lives makes it very difficult to pull all the basic facts that are most important to us. So we as EHOP, our goal, goals are to educate residents with quick and timely updates about government happenings, engage residents and town leaders in a productive discussion about town matters, and then most importantly empower residents to, with the knowledge that they learn to get involved because we believe that informed and active community members makes for a very stronger community. So why are we here tonight? Why this conversation? We're here to discuss and educate our community on our town fields, how they are managed and used, and what it means to you as a taxpayer. So why this forum now? Why now? Well, we've been hearing a lot of conversations out on the fields with friends in and around our fields about the pride in our amazing football team. I'm sure many of you have been to the games. Um, the field, some of the field vandalism that we've heard lately, synthetic turf at the school fields, Fruit Street breaking ground, on a new facility and safety at Fruit Street. We thought now would be a good time to bring the community together to engage citizen, citizens on these topics, ask questions, and hopefully gain more knowledge. So in order to do that, we needed to bring in some panelists to help us with this conversation. <coughs> so I'm gonna introduce our panelists now, over here to my left. You've got Dan Terry, who's a member of the Parks and Rec Commission. I'm out of order, so I'm gonna have to go this way. Uh, Jay Golfie, who's the director of Parks and Rec. We've got Tim Persons, who's the Director of Buildings and Grounds. Gene Birchman is the Chair of the School Committee. And John Catino, who's the Chair of the Board of Selectmen. So thank you guys for coming. We appreciate the time. I know you guys are all very busy, lots of meetings, so we appreciate the time. So how did we get here tonight? Well, it kind of started with us as a board asking questions to each other and not knowing some of the answers. And as we started talking to friends, coworkers, neighbors, some of them didn't know the answers either, so we wanted to start to reach out. Some of the questions included the construction at Fruit Street. Um, what is the building going to be? Will it be an indoor practice facility? What happened to the temporary lights at Fruit Street? And will there ever be permanent lights? How do you rent grass or turf field in this town? And who do I contact to do that? Is there a proposal for turf fields at the schools? And why is there a disparity in field conditions between one field and another? Those are some questions that we constantly get and talk to each other. And so we decided it was, it was kind of our time to go out and get the answers. So <clears throat> after meeting with our panelists and, our, and other town leaders, we decided that the best way to start tonight is to go through, put, we put together a, a chart of all of our fields in town. So this is kind of what we came up with. We went through multiple versions of how to make it easy to read. And you got it, I see you flipping through your brochure, you've got it in front of you too. So kind of to explain the chart, our fields are kind of broken up into, um, we, we created a chart to define ownership, which includes maintenance, budgeting, and scheduling of all of our fields. So as you can see, the first column over there is the Hopkinton School Department. And pretty much any field that's on school grounds is owned, operated by the schools. And then the next column over there, and you can see, I won't run through every field, but you can see that includes Center School, Elmwood, Hopkins, and then everything around the high school and middle school. Second column is the Parks and Rec. Um, their fields include part ownership of Fruit Street. And what we didn't understand until we started talking with the panelists here is that they have 
half and half ownership with Hopkinton Youth Soccer. So there's 50% ownership between the two. And they, you know, the panelists can certainly get into more detail when we, when we ask questions, but they also include Victory Field, Emerald Hills, Daniel Shea's, Reed Park, EMC Fields, Kerrigan Fields, Pine Field, and then other properties such as the Town Common, Sandy Beach, and the EMC Playground. And then there, the third column includes the Hopkinton Youth Soccer, who has partial ownership of the Fruit Street Fields as well. And then the fourth column is other fields that people kind of forget about is privately owned fields, such as the YMCA fields that we all use in some capacity, Cornell's, which is owned by Abby Villa Soccer, and then the baseball fields, baseball and softball diamonds behind Cornell's as well. So those are all fields that we as a community use in one capacity or another. One thing to note to try and understand the chart better is if, if you, anybody who uses like, if you move out of your column, there's a fee associated with that. So field hockey, for example, even though they're a school run program, they use the Fruit Street fields. So there's a fee associated with the renting that field. That was something that was the most confusing to us until we got clarification. So if you go out of your column, there's a fee associated with that. Another um, thing to note, which I kind of did before, is that the Fruit Street Fields is a shared agreement between Parks and Rec and Hockey Team Soccer. There's different times of the month that it's managed by each organization. So is, is it, is, it looks a little confusing, but I think it kind of spells it out a little bit. A, we have a lot of fields. B, there's a lot of different people involved. So that's kind of how we wanted to start the discussion tonight. Um, We've prepared a few questions to start off tonight for our panelists that we're going to ask, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So first questions go to Parks and Rec <clears throat> regarding the construction of Fruit Street. So first question is, for those that don't know, there's construction going on Fruit Street. Um, is this what, what was passed at town meeting last year to fund, and can you share with us what the building will consist of and the status of the project? So um, funding kind of came in two parts. Um, initially, there was a $500,000 grant from CPC for the building, but then as we got going on the project and we started to understand the scope of it and some of the additional costs to tie into electricity and water and, and that type of thing, um, we got some solid numbers and we went back and got an additional $400,000, a total $900,000 CPC funds. And uh, for the use of the building, um, is, I, I kind of look at it as, as uh, four different things. One, um, uh, a pavilion so that kids can get out of the weather and, and be in a safe spot if the storm rolls in, a place where people can get out of the sun, that type of thing. Uh, concessions, so kind of like a, a, a doghouse area where we can have concessions. Um, bathrooms, as we went through the process and and kind of socialize this. A lot of the users down there felt like their kids and themselves and their parents all wanted to uh, have access to something even nicer than the port potty. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the fourth one is is um, storage. Right now down there we've got um, three or four storage containers. They just um, they're effective at, at uh, for, for for putting things in, but they're really not designed to store things in. Throughout the winter, I think uh, in any of our user groups will be, will be happy to have a, a dryer and a better organized space to, to keep some of the equipment that they use, uh, some of the equipment that they need to store, and some of the other things. And the status, like when, what's the projected? I'm going to hand that over to, to Jay, because Jay's kind of in our critical work on it. Uh, so we broke ground, I want to say, in the middle of beginning of October, middle of October. Um, we anticipated opening next month. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So um, another question we had for Parks and Rec is: Are there and you don't you know without giving us too much detail? Are there other proposals out for town meeting for this year from Parks and Rec? <laughs> so yeah, one of the challenges we face as an organization is the demand by several user groups to be on the Fruit Street um, synthetic fields. We have a, a youth soccer organization with, with I think approximately 1,200 participants. 
We have a new non-contact football league. We have a contact football league. We have lacrosse. We have high school field hockey. So the challenge is, how do we get all of these athletes on these fields? And since we can't create new fields down there, the only the only option we saw is to extend the time that you can play, which comes to lights. Uh, a year ago, we, we tried out um, some portable temporary lights with mixed results. Um, they were adequate for practicing, not really adequate to have games and you know high school varsity level competitions. So we identified the need possibly to uh, install permanent lights down there. So we're currently, I've engaged one company that does this specifically, and when we get the results back from this particular organization and do our research, we're probably going to ask the uh, Community Preservation Committee for the funding for that, because we think it's a, a, pretty, a pretty big need right now. Um, also considering recently we had a meeting, there is a big push now for a new organization to play cricket. So where are we going to play cricket? <laughs> um, can cricket be played at night under lights? Can cricket be played on synthetic turf? As the town changes and we're getting new activities that people want to engage in, we have to consider basically increasing the amount of time we can, we can uh, be on this field. Okay. Thank you. So now questions for the Hopkinton schools. Um, we know there was recently a forum um, about the new proposed turf fields on fields four and five. As brief as you can make it, what is the status of this project?
town can be proud of as we bring in you know, school, other schools, and, and so on. So um, right now, the status is, is that it's still under repair. Um, believe it or not, that those pictures were taken as right after the incident had happened, and the repairs actually make the the tracks look worse. You know, so we take. We take a tire track that may be, you know, 12 or 14 inches wide, and it ends up being, you know, 18 inches wide because now we're spreading new, uh, new loam over it and then seeding and, and, and trying to hydrate it. But um, so uh, it's taken a little while, you know, to, to get them back up to snuff. I think we'll be ready for the spring. Uh, the good news is, if there is good news, you know, glass is half full. The field got plenty of rest this year, and so in the springtime when we're when we're ready for our sports, it's going to look uh, hopefully fantastic, you know. Um, as far as security, um, we don't have a lot of security down there, so to speak. Uh, there is a chain that goes up and, um, and you know, we're going to lock up that chain and try to make uh, more routine visits around working with the Hockington PD and, and, and so on. So that's kind of where we stand today with our security. Just to add into that, excuse me, another capital article that's on our spreadsheet for this year is um, more cameras around the entire school property, but specifically um, in parking lots and on the loop road. So that's, that's been something that's been on our spreadsheet for a while. We've been doing an ongoing series of security upgrades. So this year, um, you'll see that as well from the schools. Okay, thank you. So questions for the board selectmen, um, Mr. Catino. You know, according to our town vision, we know that recreation is central to our town vision. How do you see our Hopkins and Fields as being part of that vision? Well, speaking for myself, uh, you know, uh, I see Fields as a, as a part of an overarching uh, health, wellness, quality of life, um, and you know, and along with trails and uh, kind of bike paths and trail heads. You know, it, it's you know, Fields. As, like you said in the first slide, it's a, it's a great place for communities to feel open and get together and people to exercise. But it's just one part of, of, of the whole health of our people. Um, and then, um, we know that there's a large tract of land, 20 acres, designated for active recreation as part of the host agreement with Legacy Farms. What is the plan for that parcel? Um, and in addition to that, we understand there's an RFP out at for an international marathon facility at this parcel. So can you talk to that at all? Yeah, well, um, two weeks ago, the town manager was instructed to um, request proposals for, for that, that track of land um, and uh, speak with the uh, 26.2 Foundation. Uh, you know, it basically, it's, it's, it's similar to what we were going to try and do with the um, skating rink and, and, and the hockey team. Um, basically, exactly the same format. Okay. And then, I, you know, I don't know if you or Mr. Terry wants to talk. There's a lot of, I think, confusion a little bit about the CPC funding. What is it? Who can apply for it? And what all does it, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it? I guess can, can either John or you, Dan, talk to, to CPC funding? Well, I'm not on CPC, so I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to need to be brief because I don't have a lot of information, but it's a, um, the CPA funds are, are funds that come where we pay um, some additional money on our tax bills, and it gets uh, um, accumulated into this CPA funds. Um, within there, there are different buckets. Um, up there is open space, historic, affordable housing, and then active and passive recreation. Um, I'm not sure who is oh, who, who can apply, but historically, I know I know Parks and Rec has, has always had uh, in, the, in the five years that I've been on the commission, we've always had projects that we've um, gotten funding for through through CPA. Uh, and the only other thing on that is I think that there's a there's a match with the state as well on some of this, but it's not something that we can uh, uh, we find out in the year how much. All right, so 
In addition to the panelists up front, um, we've also invited some other key community members to be part of the audience to help potentially continue the dialogue further, answer questions that um, the panelists might not have the answers for. So please, those of you that you know who you are, if you have answers in addition to the answers that they give, please don't hesitate to stand up and chime in when necessary. Um, so at this point, we'd like to open it up for audience questions. I told you I'd be short, so we want this to be more about you guys asking questions. Um, but also, in this question and answer period, please remember to be respectful of one another's questions. You know, don't hog the mic. Come up, ask a question. You can ask a follow-up question, but um, we want to make sure everybody gets their chance to get up and get hurt. So um, at this point, if anybody's got a question, please come on up to the mic, which is right here. And Hello. Hi. Um, so with the investment in turf fields, can you speak to how long do the turf fields, uh, how long are they in play before they need to be repaired or significant subsequent investments need to go in? Sure. Typically, a synthetic turf field lasts anywhere between 8 and 12 years. Um, so you need to plan. If you're going to install one, you need to start planning the day you install it on how you're going to replace it. But typically, the, the shelf life is eight to ten years, assuming you're maintaining it properly. Subsequent. So then, uh, so my numbers are a little rough, but if I recall correctly, the fruit tree was roughly a million dollars, and if I heard correctly, the fields four and five are requested to be two point seven five. So we're looking at a significant cost per year of an ongoing investment from the town and from start point in perpetuity versus the grass field. Is that correct? Just, uh, just another information point that uh, a little bit more detailed to Jay's answer. If I could just go back to the other one. Um, so the Fruit Street fields, we don't have a dollar amount for what it would cost to resurface the field. It's basically the carpet that needs to be get, get done. Uh, but uh, Jay and I and Amy Nick from Hockey Youth Soccer walked the field with the company that did the installation about a month ago, and uh, we found out that it probably has at least four to five years left, which would bring us to 12 or 13 years. So um, with, with proper maintenance, it, it can end up being longer than that eight to 10. I mean, he said that, that, that gentleman said that there are instances where there are fields that need to be replaced in seven years. But, Fortunately, here in town, we've done a pretty good job, job of maintaining it. Um, if, I don't know if, uh, um, so, so first of all, just in, in terms of the numbers that you were asking about, I think Front Street is actually $1.6 million, not $1 million, whenever that was installed many years ago. Um, the current estimate for fields four and five is $3.8 million, so $2.7 million. Number that I, that I mentioned earlier is the amount of the grant that we've requested from CDC. There are portions of the project that are not eligible for CDC funding, um, and we knew right off the top that it was that portion that didn't reflect that, and then from there, um, they'll determine from the rest what's eligible. Um, so in terms of paying for replacement down the road, first, um, and if you look at it just from a money perspective, there's a difference in maintenance costs certainly between a turf field and a, a natural field. For, for the school department in particular, we are so short on usage hours that the added time that is available through the field for our athletes to practice um, is a critical reason why we are bringing this forward in addition because we live in New England, which has many wonderful benefits. Also comes with that snow. Typically our spring sports tryouts are either very delayed or inside. Um, there's just a lot that you can't control living in New England regarding the snow. So with the ability to have turf fields extends, again, the amount of hours that are available to our athletes and our, our student population is increasing quite a bit. But um, the thing that I wanted to say as well about replacement costs is you know, um, Parks and Rec and Youth Soccer have a revolving fund set up through the town where the um, proceeds from rentals are deposited and the purpose of that is to pay for maintenance as well as to offset the future cost of 
replacement when carpet needs to be replaced. We have been working with Parks and Rec on a similar agreement so that, um, and I don't, you can stop me if I'm going into too much detail, but the, the general um, conversation, the general agreement that we have so far is that there will be periods of time designated for school use, and then beyond that, Parks and Rec will manage the schedule for the fields at um, the high school property, and they will be rented out at rates similar to what Fruit Street is renting out for. We will have lights, so that would add value. If they go ahead and have lights, then that would be comfortable. We have baseball and softball, which they currently don't have, and which is really being charged on premium in this area. And so again, there'll be a revolving fund set up for that money for all the proceeds from the rentals will be deposited in that fund that will pay for maintenance and it will offset um, the future costs of replacement of the carpet as well. Can I just I think just getting back to your question specifically, Alder, where, where I think you suggested that the replacement cost would be two point eight million dollars. Oh. We don't know. Oh, yeah, I was quoting. I was quoting. Oh, no, no, no. I just, I just want to clarify. Yeah. I, I think for, for uh, uh, because of uh, uh, Jean's invited me to participate on that committee, so I've been to a lot of meetings. I, I don't think that there's that two point eight million would be a replacement cost in today's dollars. I, I'm hesitant to come up with a, a number because I, I don't know the exact number, but I would guess it would be less than half of that number would, would be the replacement cost. Well, right, okay, so Gene said it, they I'm not, feels, I'm sorry if I'm not in <laughs> but uh, so Gene said that uh, fields four and five were 3.6 million. 3.8, but that's the entire installation, not the replacement of the carpet. Okay. okay. So, so just for rough, rough numbers, how much does fields four and five cost to maintain today? Because 3.8 million, just rough divided by 10, we're looking at an incremental annualized cost of $380,000 for what we're signing. So I think just in rough numbers, again, I'm on that turf committee as well, um, as we had gone through, um, I think the overall just an estimated number um, for each field maintenance wise is about twenty five thousand a year grass fields. I think what we had talked about, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, maintenance of a turf field is about nine thousand a year from the take. Depends on the size. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was one of the you know, kind of one of the points that jumped out to us. Um, and again I think with uh, the uses I want to say the use on a grass field per season is about 250 uses, whereas in a turf field, I think we were closer to 750 uses per per season. Um, you know, that's obviously extending into the into the night and um, the wear and tear that uh, a turf field can take in, in comparison to a grass field. <coughs> Suggesting that we're going to save money by putting turf in, I think this is, this is much more of a utilization issue, and it's it's, it's given um, everyone in town an opportunity to, to get out on these fields days after the snow melts, as opposed to waiting into waiting until May. Mm -hmm. Just to add, one of the benefits of a synthetic field is you can plow. So when you get into March and you have lacrosse tryouts and you have, you know, even softball and baseball tryouts and you can't play on, on grass or, or, or dirt, we plow the streets at, we plow the fields at Fruit Street typically at the end of February, beginning of March, because we host a bunch of soccer tournaments up there. And in the last two years, I think the high school has had their lacrosse tryouts, their softball tryouts, their, because the fields are just unplayable. So it's, to, to echo Dan's point, it's way more of a um, utilization issue than it is a, a you know, long-term cost savings, or I don't think we're coming at it from that angle necessarily. I think it's more of, we have a lot of student athletes, we have a lot of youth sports. Um, how, do we get them on, how do we get them on safe playable fields? And you know, how do we guarantee that every year? Thank you. Uh, they can be 
cloud makes me wonder um, if the animals got onto a turf field and drove around the same way they did on those fields of day, can that turf be ripped up the same way um, or is it only, you know, you would, you it only takes a vehicle when it's plowed carefully as a flower? Is it susceptible in the same way? If someone wants to go to Fruit Street and tear up those fields, and they're on a mission to tear up those fields, then sure, they can, they can do that. What you saw on that slide there, though, would be a lot harder to do on a synthetic field, considering we have these enormous snow plows on them, plowing fields with, with no damage at all. So you can drive your car on them, you can drive pretty good-sized commercial vehicles on those fields um, with no damage at all. As opposed to, you know, if you, if you were to drive those trucks on a, on a grass field, they would be destroyed. Um, the, other, the other difference, too, is that if, if the turf fields are installed, there will be fencing all around the turf fields where there currently is not. There's no fencing. There is a, a gate um, that's not that difficult to get around clearly on um, field 13, but there's no fencing in this area, and there would be fencing all the way around. So there would be entry gates, but they'd be much narrower. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we do have an Apple article for um, security cameras along the loop road for this year, so those would be in place. If this were to pass, those would be in place by the time those work um, came online. Other questions for anyone? Can I add a question onto that? You know, um, piggybacking the fact that field hockey really mostly plays at turf now. So I know in, in discussions with all of you and with each other, we've also noticed and been seeing that the transportation from students over to the turf field has caused some conflict issues, just questions, uh, you know, between obviously students, between administration, between, you know, everything, safety. Has that, you know, is that is that something that you guys are thinking about too in terms of transporting kids to and from for, for practices and games? So that's a good question. We don't provide transportation to practice or to games at Fruit Street. Um, so that that is a challenge, especially for parents of sub varsity team members because they typically are not in an age where they're driving. It's less of an issue usually for varsity because the kids will give each other rides. Um, that said, there's not a plan currently that I'm aware of, and Tim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, John, there's not a plan that I'm aware of right now to add busing in. We do have other sports. 
sports like ice hockey and um, skiing and golf where we don't provide transport swimming. The kids have to get themselves there. The parents have to get them there. So it's not, um, you'll have to stop with all these sports in that situation. Other questions from the audience? <clears throat> for um, uh, the fruit street, or uh, sorry, the fields four and five, can somebody just watch them? What's the process for that to get approved and what can citizens do to voice their opinion about it? Sure. Um, so we have had two public forums at the, to date, and those are, if you care to search for them, they're on the H Cam. Um, and I believe they're posted on the website that we have for the um, for the turf field subcommittee. So um, there is a subcommittee. All of those meetings are public. Our minutes and agendas are on the school committee website. You can follow it there. You can certainly ask any of us to sort of get you up to speed on the process so far. The next steps are that um, we will have another public forum in the spring closer to the town meeting. By that time, we will have gone up to bid, so we will have a more refined number for the actual cost. By that time, we also will have heard back from CPC about how much of the project they're able to fund. After those two things happen, we will be able to work with the town treasurer to get a tax impact number for people so that that information will be available. At that point, um, a town meet, it has to pass a town meeting, so by a two-thirds majority of the people present at town meeting, which is always the first Monday in May in the school auditorium. Um, following that, because it would be a debt exclusion, there will, it will be on the ballot. And I don't have, I, off the top of my head, John, I don't know if you know the date for the, the election, but it's, it's, check, it's the third Monday. The 6th right? and 20th. The 6th and the 20th. Um, so those <clears> are the two steps. Um, we are going out to bid contingent on approval at town meeting. So if it were to pass a town meeting and at the ballot, we could break ground immediately after school is over and they could be playable um, in September. Uh, so that would be the most aggressive and optimistic timeline. That's off by a day, 7th and 21st. 7th and 21st. Is there any chance that we would not be discussed at town meeting? Because I thought like last year we had gone through the forum process, but then for whatever reason it was dropped from either the town meeting or whatever the next step in the approval was. Yes. So what happened last year, uh, we had just, we had started this process. We did, the school committee had it um, on its capital warrant our capital request sheet um, last year, but we really were not far enough along in the process to have a, a valid number. We hadn't had, to, we, by the time we got started, we had missed the application window for the CBC grants, which we felt were really important to pursue. So for a number of reasons, we felt like, the school committee felt like we were not ready to go forward last year. So prior to town meeting, we voted to remove it from our capital list. The work never stopped. I think a lot of people thought, oh, the project is over. Um, the work never stopped. We had put it on there in the hopes that we would be ready, and we weren't. Um, we didn't feel like we had you know, enough information. We weren't far enough in the process. We hadn't applied for CPC funding. So we took it off last year with the intention of continuing our work um, and, and our goal of getting it back on the warrant this year. And does the selectmen get briefed on it? And, you know, where do they stand relative to this? They do so well. The selectmen uh, let John answer because he actually is one, but they do. Um, they do review all of the capital um, articles, and they have control of um, what goes on the ballot. And um, so, yeah. And where as to where do they stand on it, we have not made a presentation. They have not taken a vote, so I don't think there's an answer to that question. But we certainly worked hard to keep them informed. Actually, Brian Burr is a selectman. He's a liaison to our committee, so he comes to all of the subcommittee meetings, and he's um, he's current on the development of the project. But I shouldn't be talking. So I'll fill that in. Just sit right next to Brian. Okay. <laughs> He'll fill you right in. But hey, nice the chair. What's your perspective on it? Um, as, as I said, I haven't. Uh, they haven't made the proposal to us. So there, there haven't been any, any hard numbers. There haven't been anything that hasn't been anything coming before us yet. So I, I don't want to speak on some school. So 
So the first phase is 3.8 million. What is the second phase? So very good question. Uh, we don't have an answer because it's far enough down the road that we wouldn't have a, a valid number right now. What we have done, um, the reason we have schematic drawings for both phases is because is two two big reasons. One is the drainage, which starts in the parking lot, which is, as you're looking at it, at the very bottom of the screen, goes under the football field, under fields four and five. So here? It goes underneath. Oh, yeah. From the start. Starts here? Yep. It goes, it goes under. all the way up to the top, basically. Yeah. Um, so in order to make sure, and then in addition, if, if phase one is approved and goes forward, and we enter into phase two, what we're planning is to actually expand the track from six lanes to eight lanes, make the, the field bigger because the football field that we currently have is too small to play a regulation lacrosse or soccer game on. Um, so it's not it's not large enough for those to be for a closer to the game, for example. Um, so we would make the field larger and widen the track. So all of the planning, that would involve pushing that retaining wall out. So all of the planning needed to be done together so that we don't do project one and then five years later say, oh no, now we can't push out the retaining wall. So um, it's been done all, of, all at the same time. We're going through the Conservation Commission um, permitting process for, the, for all phases of the project all at the same time so that we know that they have checked that everything will work together. The other thing that you don't see on here, but that we worked very hard to make sure was incorporated into the plan is that we have recently um, built a new cross country course for our middle schoolers, which is beautiful if you have not walked it and really, really encourage you to do so. But it, it, it comes off the center trail and up um, kind of at the edge of where it says softball field, and then it goes in between the um, fields four and five and the bottom of field three, and it goes, I don't know, they just keep on running and doing different loops. But it weaves all through there, and so we were able to work with um, the people who were in the country force, we able to work with our designer to make sure that gates were placed, placed properly and fences were placed properly. Well, placed Place properly so that they didn't interfere with the cross country course. Um, so we actually had a few weeks ago, we had a cross country meet at the same time that we had several practices going on on fields four and five. And it just was a really nice moment when the kids came out of the woods and were running. Literally, practice stopped, and all of the kids, uh, the soccer kids, stopped and we were cheering for the middle schoolers running in the cross country course. And that's really. Um, you know, it was, it was just a wonderful moment for all the kids to be supporting each other out here on the campus. Comment by Mr. Hearn. So I don't make all the meetings, and Gene, I probably should know the answer to this, but I don't at the moment. If we do four and five, fields four and five, phase one, and for whatever reason, two or three years down the road, decide not to do field three and just stay with grass there, Will the infrastructure of four and five be fine without us doing phase two? Yes, it will. Although um, the track will need to be replaced. When we resurf we re did a resurface of the track, so we didn't um, we didn't redo the, the right base. words. Yeah. yeah. So they, that's where we will come to the end of the usable life of the subface. The, um, the entire track would have to be replaced, not just the surface of the track. But so, so that will need to be done. Whether the town supports expanding it and adding a turf field is a question that the town will decide, at, you know, at that time. But that's a few years down the road. But that's independent of whether we do the turf field for the football field or not. Yes. We still have to do the track at some point. Yes. Yep. Got it. Okay. And to clarify too. Um, the new track that people see now is just the surface of the track, right? Can you explain that? Like what goes into the, under the track? Because I think people <laughs> might be confused if they see the new track, yeah. why don't you replace it, right? Yeah, so um, I didn't replace the track. Uh, I think that was done in uh, 2012. Um, 
was the surface replacement, but uh, obviously when you do any kind of uh, infrastructure work as a, as a sub-base drainage, um, you know, kind of layers upon layers of stuff, uh, and then you put the surface down. What happens is, uh, after years of use, uh, the sub-base will start to loosen and, and kind of crumble, so you just have to, you know, like paving a road, you know, um, when they do a replacement, they'll scrape off the top and, and, uh, and put a new skin over it. But eventually you have to take care of all the stuff. You'll see the cracking and, and dipping, and that's what will start happening to the track, is that it will dip and wave and, and you know, all, all those sorts of, of things. So, uh, so the next phase for the track would have to be a kind of a ribbon replace. Any other questions from anyone? One other, I probably should know this answer too, but I don't. So, when you went to CPC, and I was not able to attend that meeting, to make the request for the 2.7 million. Was that a request for a 2.7 million funding immediately, or was that a request for a 2.7 million bonded, where CPC would then pay the note against that loan? Um, so Dan probably knows the answer to this question better. The short answer is we didn't specify. However, they, whatever money they're able to offer, um, to offer the cost of this, and however they're able to do it, um, I feel like it's their decision. But I, I do agree that that's often what they do is bond a project, um, as opposed to, you know, they don't just write, write a check, for example. But do you that's want to add to that? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you. Years for a second. I have a really parochial question about Food Street. Netting. Is there any chance that we can get nets where the wilderness patches are on the other side of Fruit Street to keep the balls from going out there? Is there any discussion about adding netting around the other side of Fruit Street? Um, we, we, we actually have a request into CPC for that this year. Um, in our last meeting, we talked about our priorities, and it's it's not among our highest priorities. But uh, CPC has a lot of work to do in, in terms of the, the request that, that that all the groups have gone in with, including Parks and Rec, including these, these turf fields. So I, I think that there's uh, uh, you know where where it falls <coughs> on CPC's required um, priorities needs to be seen. So. Like order of magnitude, what kind of cost is for initial money? So when we when we did the, the end line, the, the end, um, and I'm gonna guess that that's is it the same length, Jay? Mm -hmm. So it's the same length. That was that was fifty thousand dollars, so it's about fifty thousand dollars per side, give or take. Um, there were and, uh, as I recall that there were a lot of questions around whether that was necessary.
how that works. Is that easing the tax burden? Is that an additional tax? I don't think people really fully understand CPC and how that could help in terms of people's taxes. Sure. Thanks. So that's a good question. So CPC money, so the town, when did we go to accept CPC? I think it was around 2000. 2000. Um, so a portion of your taxes every year automatically goes into CPC and there's state matching that Tan described. Um, so you have you've already contributed that money, basically, and the state has matched it. So from our perspective, taking money that the town already has and applying it to this project or any of the projects that, that, um, that they apply it to saves you an additional income from the town. So if you take the total project cost, and we'll call that A, and you take what CPC is willing to or able to contribute, and we'll call that B, and you subtract B from A and you get C, and that would be the total amount of money that would come from the tax base. When we know that number, then the town treasurer does some kind of borrowing rates and terms and lengths and fears and I don't know, Pam Wexlex knows how that works and she might be the only person in the room, um, to come up with what the tax the average per family household cost would be. But we're many steps away from that number right now. So this CPC bucket, let's call it, do you have to use it <coughs> a certain year or does it just continually keep rolling over from one year to the next? We, as a town, we do continue to contribute to it, and the state does continue to match it. And um, so there is, there is a balance, uh, a decent sized balance in that. Um, the last <coughs> report I saw, it was over $3 million, but uh, we're still waiting to see uh, final numbers on when we were at the end of last year, at the end of last fiscal year, from the finance director. I think at CPC, we're going to hear that at the next meeting. So. We've done a good job as a town, as a town of saving money in that CPC account for projects. Can I just add to that real quick? So if you go home and you look at your quarterly tax bill, right on your quarterly tax bill it's going to say CPA funding or something along those lines. It's going to be 2%, and that's what it is. It's charged 2%. So if you're paying $1,000 in, in property taxes, <coughs> Unfortunately, none of us are, but if that's what you're paying, then $200 would be going into the CPA fund. And that's been going on at Hopkinton for the last 17 or 18 years. The state matches that to about $20. $20, sorry. Uh, that, that amount goes to uh, into that fund. It's been going for 20 years or so, 18 years. And then the state, I think, matches about 37%, somewhere in that range. It's not a dollar for dollar match. But that money builds up over time. But if you want to sort of see evidence of what we're talking about with CPA, look at your quarterly tax bill. It's written right on there. And one more question. You said there's about $3 million in the current account. What does that mean? That means that that's available money to be applied for that we would vote on at town meeting 2018? Uh, yeah, so, so um, the way the process works really quickly is, is groups come in with seeking grants uh, and, and the commission makes a recommendation uh, as to what, what, to, what projects to delegate money towards and, and which ones not to. Uh, I believe the selectmen sign off on that uh, and then it does go to town meeting to, to, for approval. But um, you know, to, to Brian's point and to Gene's point, Money that's spent out of CPC is, is money that we've already been lending tax-wise, and, and it, it wouldn't increase a, a tax burden in the future. Uh, if I could, I'd like to make a pitch for town meeting. Please. <laughs> <Please. laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> because what happens, you know, if there are only 200 people at town meeting, town meeting ultimately spends this money. Town meeting can shift around the CPA funds and, and really any other funds within the budgets. So it's incumbent upon the voters in the community uh, who all have an interest in their own pocketbooks to show up at town meeting and weigh in on how these monies are being spent. And so this is encouragement you know, quite, a, quite a few months early 
for people to stand in, in May and, uh, and really participate in our democracy. Yes, thank you, town moderator, for your point. Other questions, please? <clears throat>
fields that we can't water. Right. That's going to be one follow-up question. Uh, okay. Across the board, I'll allow. Uh, they do a lot of talking about stuff because my husband's on the board, and they don't actually come out and ask questions and do things. He's on his way. <laughs> uh, they want to build this wall. It's a cement wall. It's a bounce back wall that's used by lacrosse and soccer players. They've got one at Sudbury. Um, they have outside sponsors that do it, uh, that pay for it. How can we go about one hour of space for this and getting you guys on board? Come to a Parks and Rec, uh, first of all, talk to Jay, Parks and Rec Director, about that. Yeah, I'm sure that he'd, bring, he'd encourage you to come to a Parks and Rec Commission meeting. And um, I, 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 I believe that we could find space at Fruit Street for that, if that's what that board has in mind, is, is the Fruit Street. Thank you. And to echo the moderator's point, um, you know, at this point, you've learned a lot. So, you know, where can we all go as citizens to follow up on, where's the best place to go to follow up on what the actual number is going to be, what the actual tax effect is going to be for the turf field, for the Fruit Street facility, all these proposals that you guys are, are making, you know, websites, come to meetings, what are you recommending so that we can know the right places to go? Whoever. I'm going to confirm. It's a long name. We need an acronym. John will be checking for that. I should really know that. That's fair. But in addition, as I said, we will be having another forum in the spring closer to town meeting. We are probably able to have a sidewalk as well. If people want to come down and just talk about people and get a better sort of first view of what will be changing. And you know, other than that, I put in a big plug for HPM. They film all of our meetings. The school committee, John, or I report on um, We get the liaison report regarding the athletic field subcommittee at every school committee meeting, whenever activity is going on. They've made several presentations to the full school committee as well. So, um, you know, we have minutes from all of the subcommittee meetings. Um, those are available. So, the it is long. The Facebook group is the Hopkinton Athletic Field Subcommittee. Um, <laughs> the Twitter feed is at Hopkinton Fields. And the website, the easiest way I can say it is, is if you go to the school district website under school committee, it's linked there. And we're going to work on the usability factor. <laughs> <laughs> but you also, there is also a Facebook page and your own website yeah. and all that stuff for the Athletic Field Subcommittee. Jay. Any other questions from anyone? Yes? Jay, if you're recognizing that um, some of the infrastructure work that's being done right now at Fruit is yes. setting the stage for lighting the fruit. Do you have any sense of the roughly incremental cost of lighting fruit once the current project is We're, we're lear um, literally waiting to get that number from Musco Lighting. <laughs> so we'll, we'll try to make that public as soon as we know. So the placeholder we have with MC is six hundred thousand dollars. So it's about eight ten follow up. Go ahead. It's actually not a follow up related, but sure. uh, this is regarding the, the phase one project at Field Four and Five. Um, it's not clear from the diagram. Is any consideration being given to either expanding or improving, or even perhaps just lighting and parking adjacent to Fields Four and Five? That becomes a lighting facility that could be used for, for example, for renting the club teams or what have you. Um, parking can be challenging there. Right. So um, lighting is definitely included in this, in this plan as well as ADA access to the fields, which is currently challenging. Um, another capital article request that the school committee has actually is, if you see, see field nine right there, Christy, if you go over, it's like directly across from field three. Right. So we're currently um, uh, hoping to do a study that will in involve, that will look at solving several part of the problems. One is parking, one is, um, you know, due to the traffic calming, 
that the town approved last year, uh, there is no longer the ability, parents can no longer queue on Hayden Road and pick up and drop off at the high school. So all of that is taking place on the school campus. The system that we have in place right now is workable, but probably not ideal. So we're looking at that challenge as well as the additional challenge of parking. So we may end up um, paving field nine, which is directly behind the high school cafeteria. It would be a parking lot, you know, probably for staff, but this is, these are all questions that are not answered. Um, but additionally, we provide additional parking um, to your point for rentals for fields four and five, as well as for um, Any other questions from anyone? <clears throat> okay, so I think we'll um, wrap up. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Very much appreciate your time to come. Especially thank the panelists um, for coming and sharing their knowledge. I urge you very much to reach out more with questions. So, um, what do you do now? You've come, you've listened, you've heard. Hopefully you've answered some questions that have been on your mind. So what can you do now? The first thing that we always try to tell people is engage now, right? So if there's something that you're interested in, reach out. You get on the computer, get on the website. Find these fabulous people. They take your emails, they're good at responding. We know we've been emailing them and harassing them for the past few weeks, so to get knowledge ourselves. Engage now, get, get involved now. Um, the second thing, as the moderator said, stressed, is attend town meeting. It's, it's, we can't stress it enough to come and voice your opinions. Hopefully by the time you get to town meeting, you will have all the knowledge you need based on these forums and all, everything we have. Um, and then the third thing is obviously vote. Get out there and vote at the election. And as Mr. Graziano mentioned, 21st is, is the election. Um, and then <clears throat> the first, fourth, last thing, obviously, is follow me up in all the ways that you can. Facebook, Twitter, um, go to our website, um, ehop.org. We also, please, you can sign your, put your email down and subscribe to our email blog. Like, like we said in the beginning, we try to keep everything concise, simple, as much as we can because we know you get a lot of emails out there. Subscribe if you haven't. Like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter and Instagram to get all the avenues of information you can. Um, and last but not least, and very importantly, come out Friday night and uh, experience the fields there now. Cheer on the Hillers. Big football game playoffs here at home. So go Hillers and thanks again for coming. Thank you.